Uh, welcome to this evening's session, the do's and don'ts of Power BI relationships. Uh, my name is Peter Myers, and I come all the way from Melbourne, Australia. And uh, I'm doing a bit of a world tour. This is number two. I was in Istanbul last week. As a rehearsal of this session, tonight you get the real deal. Um, I have worked with Microsoft BI products for now close to 20 years, and uh, I have the privilege of having evolved alongside SQL Server and Excel Power Pivot and now Power BI, and I've got to confess, it's a really interesting story, and I'm very grateful for such a fascinating career. That's what I do. I also work indirectly with Microsoft, so some of the guidance documentation that you might be referring to at Microsoft.com um, is starting to be written by me. That's probably enough about me. What I'd like to do is very quickly, as I do with most of my presentations, is have you tell me something about yourself. Please, in the next minute, could you use the QR code or the tiny URL and uh, answer some simple questions. Okay, so the mic's still working. Good. All right. Uh, thanks for participating in the survey. Um, this is an awesome topic about Power BI and real time, but it's not what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, but what I'm interested to know is less about gender and age, although if I had time, it's really cool to work with a decomp tree with this data, um, is to know where you're coming from. So we've got a lot of BI developers in the room. Tonight's topic about relationships is really about modeling, uh, where you have more than one table in your model, and I hope that you do have more than one table in your model. How are you going to appropriately relate those tables together? So we really are targeting BI developers and the BI analysts, so that's the 28 and the 9. Um, data wizards, well, they're covered for everything. Um, and for the rest of you, look, it's all applicable. When I take a look at the next question, which was, what is your self-rating for Power BI? Uh, and that's really cool. So we've got people that are completely new. I hope that you're in the right room and you're welcome either way. Um, but tonight is a fairly, uh, what can I say, and a fairly advanced topic. So if you are new to Power BI, I suggest stick it out, maybe grab a second beer, and uh, just go with the flow of what tonight is about, because it's not an introduction to modeling, it's really the next level of relationships and, and what can they do for us. Uh, for the person that's number 10, I would love a second here, and you're welcome to come up here and present the topic for me. Who is that? Chris Webb, where are you? <laughs> um, I like playing this game, like if I ask you the question, what is the average rating tonight? If, uh, everybody that's submitted, what's the average? <coughs> it's a reasonable question, isn't it? But the dashboard wasn't designed to address that question, was it? It's providing a histogram of based on the rating, what is the frequency? So how could I fix this? Sack the BI developer and start again. <laughs> This is a great time where we might use that feature known as Q&A and just say, all right, well, if the visual doesn't directly answer the question, we'll just ask it ourselves. What is the average Power BI experience? And the exact answer being 5.22. If I recognize that that is a recurring question that I'm going to ask time and time again, I'm going to pin that back to the dashboard, and then I can continue to monitor it. All right. There was one other question that I asked. What were the submissions by the question? I'm curious to know. What is the most interesting topic for you guys tonight? <laughs> many to many relationships. Yes, we will certainly talk about them, but they're disappointment for the next group. 
no discussion on romantic relationships tonight, but I'm happy to have a discussion offline with you later if I'm attracted to you. All right, one to many relationships we certainly talk about, strong and weak relationships we talk about, and many to one. Disappointing, they're actually the same as one to many, so we'll talk about them as well, and of course we'll talk about one to one. All right, many to many is in fact the most requested topic because it's a complex um, problem to solve. Um, and you'll learn tonight there's actually two different uh, approaches, or in fact two different challenges that many to many can deliver to us. So with that introduction, thank you very much for sharing your input. Tonight the outline is very simple. How do I model relationships and to leave with you what are good design practices for your models? So what better place to start than with bad modeling? And so here I have what I call bad modeling. Could anyone suggest why this is a bad model? There is no model. There is no model. It's incorrect, there is a model. If there's one table, there is a model. It's not normalized. It's not normalized, so it's so it's a denormalized model. Why is that bad? Repetition space. Storage space. Well, I, I should give you a little bit more of a clue. It's an import model, so the data has been imported into the model. So is that a concern for space? It's not mm -hmm. like the star schema. So it's not like a star schema. So let me just address the space issue. Is it's not necessarily like it's a column store. Even though you see a table of columns, the data is stored at column level. So there is a degree of optimization by normalizing, but not a great degree that we would go out of our way specifically to optimize that. But somebody mentioned star schema, and that's going to be relevant for tonight's topic. You see, why I would suggest that this isn't a great model is that think of the poor report author that needs to make sense of the fields painting. Single table, fields related to product or uh, sales activity or um, names of something are all just sort of thrown together. They're listed alphabetically, but that's about where the organization ends. So this is a classic example that I see, that because the source data I have is an extract from a system that is denormalized as a single, let's just say a CSV file, well then I'll model to map the source data. And we strongly recommend that you don't do this. All right? First of all, it's not friendly. And it's difficult to understand what this model actually represents and a little more challenging to find what I need to lay out my report. Uh, the next thing is, yes, you could argue that it's not optimal from a storage point of view. And uh, the next thing you might uh, get to is that as the complexity of your calculations increase, you'll find that DAX formulas you need to write become trickier when you have this single table. Right, so let's finish the demo of bad modeling right there, and let's move into the important topic of tonight, which is model relationships. All right, so simply, model relationships propagate filter context between model tables. Easier shown than said. So let's look at a very, very simple example here. A couple of tables, I've got some sales data. Um, it's very simplified. The first column are product IDs. We have the year of the sale, and we have the quantity of each sale. We then have a product table in the model as well. Defined in the model is a relationship between those two tables. Note the one and the asterisk. There's a one side on the product, and an asterisk representing the many side of the relationship to sales. Let's imagine that our visual asks a question that wants to know the sales quantity for product B. Note that product B is the product ID number two. This is what happens internally. A filter is applied to the product table and is propagated to sales that filters the table to three rows for product two, and then we see the sum of quantity is 17. That's how it works. Even if you had three tables, this time category to product and then product to sales, the question is now, what are the quantity for category A? Filter on category A propagates the product. There are two products. Those products propagate filters down to sales. And this is how it works. We want to see one more variation of this. What if in our star schema we have a date table as well? And we apply filters not just to the category table, but also to year. 
what were the sales quantity for category A in 2018, watch the animation, and look at the intersection here. For 2018, there's just the one row, and therefore the answer here is 11. That's the mechanics of how relationships work in your Power BI models. So onto the topic of good model design, it should strive to deliver the right number of tables with the right relationships. And we could probably speak for a couple of hours on that topic alone. What are the right tables, columns, and rows? All I want to say at this stage is, as my last point on the slide says, is that when it comes to model design relationships, there's no exact single right answer. And there's a bit of science and a bit of art that you have to factor and balance to produce what is the best result for your reports. So somebody earlier mentioned star schema, and I should have probably put this as a question, but should I ask the inverse? Who does not know what star schema means? Two people. I'm surprised by that. I would have thought there would be more people because star schema, as everybody in the room knows, is actually a, um, a modeling uh, design approach for relational data web analysis, right? And made famous by Ralph Kimball, right? So the Data Warehouse Toolkit was one of the first books I got my hands on and learned all about the importance of good design for relational data warehouses. Now, for the business analyst working with Power BI, I find that it's unlikely that they're familiar with what a data warehouse is, let alone what star schema design is. Yet, tonight, I'm going to take many of the concepts of star schema and convince you that they are relevant to good, optimal, Power BI model designs. All right, note that relationships don't care about referential integrity. And for those that come from a relational database background, when they see a diagram with tables and connectors connecting them, what are they thinking when they see those connectors? Constraints. Constraints. In fact, more precisely, foreign key constraints. What they're looking at in an empty relationship diagram for a database is where is integrity being enforced across these tables? Let's dispense with that Power BI doesn't care about integrity. Of course, we want you to have good quality data, so Power BI won't care if you load poor quality data and therefore have mismatching values between tables. It will compensate for them, but it won't, it won't create a problem for you otherwise. You could report over the top of it. So relationships are not concerned with referential integrity. So a bit more on star schema design. Why is it called star schema? Well, that's what a star looks like. At the center of the star is what we call a particular type of table known as a fact table. It stores the accumulation of your business activity, whether they're sales orders, temperature observations, exchange rates, whatever. These tables are typically quite large with history and they continue to grow day by day. Now the points of the star are what we refer to in star schema design as dimension tables and they describe your business entities. They are your things. Products, dates, uh, resellers, employees, and sales territories. Of course, this comes from the AdventureWorks database. All right, so this is where we come up with the terminology of star schema. Tables that describe things, dimension tables, and tables that record activity, our fact tables. So I've pretty much described dimension tables and fact tables. By the way, this presentation is fully downloadable if you can last to the end of the presentation, whereupon you get a QR code or a link, or we'll probably share it through an email as well. But note the last bullets here. You see, everything that Power BI does when visualizing the data on a report page is concerned with filtering, grouping, and summarization. Let me filter by calendar year 2019. <laughs> Let me group by country. Let me sum to achieve population. This is a consistent dance that every visual does. Let's be then more clear that the role of a dimension table is to support filtering and grouping. And the fact tables are to support the summarization of your activity. All right, this slide gives you even more details, and I'm not going to read through it, but it's a great resource to catch up with later on. I have limited time tonight, by the way, which is why I'm speaking so quickly. Now, when we add a model to, or rather, when we add a table to our model in Power BI Desktop, there are some properties that we can configure. The first is the name property itself. Those names must be unique. 
And we would ask you to be as friendly as possible with your names, be them tables, columns, hierarchies, levels, or measures, because when you add them to reports, then the titling and the legends and everything are beautifully friendly, right? So you shouldn't need to rename them. So we choose a friendly name for our table. Uh, more recently, we have the ability to control the storage of that data. Is the data imported into the table, or is it left in place with a direct query design so that when you query the model, the table itself uh, retrieves data from your source? Or is it both at the same time, which is a characteristic of composite modeling? We'll talk about this later on in this session. So a table, you can declare how its data is stored. And then there's the property of the table role. Is it a dimension or is it a fact? Yeah, I'm making that one up, by the way. <laughs> just, just watching the facial expression. It's like, I've never seen that property before. And there is no such property that declares what role your table plays. We'll come to it. Now, when we add relationships to the model, they have more properties that we can control. First of all, let's understand that the relationship is between a single column in one table to a single column in a different table. Right, always single column. Is there any exception to that? Can we have multi-column relationships in Power BI? In Power Query, you can. Yes, but that's not the model. Power Query is the pre-processing pre instructions for loading the model. Can we have multi-column relationships in Power BI? Yes. Okay, but then it's a single column, so yes, we can create. Uh, the answer is actually yes, you can in a very specific circumstance. And I had a chocolate koala for anybody that actually knew the answer there. Uh, there's a DAX function called combined values. Has anyone used it? It allows you in direct query models where the source system needs multi-column relationships to achieve this, all right? Yet still in your model, there's single column, but in the source system, it supports multi-column relationships. That's an advanced topic. We don't need to go there, but it is important that I stress. Relationships a single column in one table to single column in a different table. Now that means we cannot self-reference a relationship. What would that mean if I have a table like employees? My dimension table reports not just the employee, but the boss that the employee reports to. In a relational design, you could have a foreign key that would enforce referential integrity between the rows in the table. No such concept here. So relationships are always from a table to a different table. The properties of your relationship then, having configured the column-to-column -column relationship, is the cardinality. That's a big area of discussion for tonight. There are four options that we have. It's either one-to-many, or the reverse of many-to-one, or it's one-to-one, -one, or it's the newer many-to-many. -many. We'll explore all of them tonight. The filter direction, that propagation you saw in animation, filter of the product table, propagated filters to the sales table, is either a single direction or it can be configured for both directions. We will discuss. Uh, if you make it both directions and you're enforcing row level security, you can opt that the relationship does or does not propagate in both directions. Is the relationship active, yes or no? We will come to this. And does it assume referential integrity? Um, this is an important optimization for direct query, that if you know that referential integrity is being enforced, in the source system, you will tell the relationship that that is the case, and it therefore uses more efficient inner joins versus left outer joins when constructing queries. Uh, last point, only one active path can exist between two tables, but note my little asterisk here, maybe. <laughs> I will show you a demonstration where that might not be the case. Now back to the property of the table role itself. It is, in fact, the cardinality of the relationship that determines whether your table will act as a dimension table or as a fact table. All right? Uh, the answer there is that the one side of the relationship is what type of table? It's the dimension table, right? We define our business entities once. Our products get defined once with a unique value in a key column. And if your business is successful, I would hope in the sales table that that key value would be used many, many times, the many side of the relationship. So therefore, when we look back at the star schema design, fact table in the center, we have our relationships with many to one. So that's where we can see that the many side is the fact table, the one side is the dimension table, and that is 
a very good pattern to adopt. Where you have multiple subject areas in your model, you'll have multiple fact tables. So think of it that you have multiple stars within the same model, hopefully reusing those dimension tables. In fact, there's one dimension table that should be reused across every fact table. Your date. Your date, right. So the consistent filtering by time, we want those filters to propagate across all of the fact tables. Uh, by the way, a good tip, um, the new ability to add additional diagrams, what I often do is create one diagram for each star. Okay, so you see that now on the model diagram at the bottom, you've got like these page tabs. All right, next area of theory, and then I promise I'm going to get into a lot of demos, but the theory is important to get out of the way first, is that relationships are classified as either strong or weak. Um, this isn't a configurable property. It comes down to the design of your model, including cardinality type and the source of the data. Um, so you need to be aware that if it's a strong or weak relationship, you may get different results if you have data integrity issues within your data. So for the moment, what I'm going to do is define that relationships are strong when the query engine can determine that there is a one side to the relationship. Remember, that's our dimension type table. And what will happen, in fact, is that when the tables are related internally, it's like a virtual table is constructed. It's called table expansion, where it, it essentially does left outer joins from all of the one to many, one to many, one to many, and it produces a single, let's just say, a denormalized table. It's not truly materialized, but for calculation purposes, that's how it determines the relationships across values and columns and tables. So strong relationships will happen for all one-to-many or many-to-one relationships and one-to-one -one relationships in import and direct query models. What this means is, and do you sometimes get a little annoyed that in your slicer you have this blank? And the column that I'm slicing on doesn't have a blank in there? Okay, that's because your many-to-one relationship, the one side, um, isn't storing the value that the many side is recording. And so what Power BI is doing in this strong relationship is it's adding a blank to compensate. So it lets you identify and say, essentially, answer the question, tell me the sales of products that I don't have in my product table. That's what it's there to do. And this is a good thing. In fact, if you see those blanks in your slicer, it might suggest that you've got more work to do in cleaning up your data. Now, this is how it works. Category of product to sales, one to many relationships across them. This is what that expanded table looks like. You can think of it like denormalization. But I want you to notice that there's this product number nine that does not exist in the product table. And so what happens during table expansion for strong relationships is that we end up with those blanks. So if you did build a slicer over the product name, that is where the blank is coming from. It's automatically added to allow you to analyze the lack of integrity, so to speak. The topic of weak relationships then come in because there's a different behavior. Now this is where Power BI can't guarantee that there's a one side of the relationship. And it will happen in two specific circumstances you're using the newer many-to-many -many cardinality, so there is no one side, or your relationship is spanning what we call data islands. This applies to composite models. I've got some import data, and let's just suggest that this dimension table comes from a direct query source. They are, from Power BI's perspective, different islands of data. Now, even if there's a one-to-many relationship that is ordinarily strong, because it is cross-island, it is weak, all right? And so for that reason, what we need to be careful of is that table expansion uses inner joint semantics, not left outer joint semantics. You will not get those blanks, and you may indeed get elimination of data happening, all right? Some rows might be eliminated because there's no matching product ID, therefore you're potentially understating sales that have happened. So our point at this stage about weak relationships is that they will happen for many to many, so be very careful, and they will happen cross-island uh, when relationships are relating tables from different stores, all right? So therefore, and I'll say the upfront guidance is, be very, very careful and conscious of data integrity in those scenarios. 
All right, lots of theory, just a little more to go. Quiz time. Not sure if this is completely visible at the back of the room, but here is a composite model that has vertipack data that's imported and some tables in a direct query source and relationships between tables. Can anyone tell me where the strong relationships are? Is it this many to many relationship here in the vertipack store? No. no. Is it the one to many between two tables in the vertipack store? Yes. Absolutely. What about the one to many between the direct query tables? Yes, because they're in the same source. Very good. Right. <laughs> Which are the weak relationships? Well, always many to many, and here we have a one to many spanning data stores. All right, that's how you'll detect it. It is not a property that you'll configure. You will not see it highlighted. You just have to be aware. Um, there is deficiency in the current model designer today. You can't visually see it. You actually have to select a table, understand its source, and uh, it would be very time consuming if you didn't develop it to understand where those relationships or those weak relationships are lurking. All right, last piece of theory, then I'm into demo. So when it comes to the calculation logic that we might add to the model, um, be it calculated tables, calculated columns, or measures, there are DAX functions that are specifically concerned with relationships. So related and related table allow us to navigate relationships. Use relationship, as I'll demonstrate, allows us to switch between active and inactive relationships for the purpose of a single calculation. Uh, cross filter allows us to modify filter directions or indeed even disable a relationship. Um, treat as allows us to work with virtual uh, relationships. Um, in fact, we can propagate filters in whatever way we want to achieve the results we would like. And finally, the path functions are very brief word. I won't demonstrate them. Uh, but if you do have that recursive um, data, like employees reporting to bosses or general ledgers reporting to other general ledgers, uh, while a relational system can enforce integrity through a self-referencing foreign <laughs> key, there's no such thing as a self-referencing filter or relationship. Uh, but we have a family of functions known as the path functions. And essentially what you'll need to do is use these functions to naturalize that recursive relationship into columns, and then you can build your standard fixed level relation, uh, hierarchies over it. All right. So that gives you a lot of theory to think about. I'm going to reinforce most of it through a series of good modeling demonstrations. Are there any questions at this stage? Can you give an example of a business use case where you have to use many-to-many -many relationships that you cannot solve with a one-to-many relationship? Uh, absolutely, I'm going to give you several in demo. So your question is a good one, and it's going to be addressed directly through some demo right now. All right, so many to many is the number one requested, and I'll make sure that it gets adequate coverage. So here we are in a fresh new Power BI desktop solution. The first thing I like to do is save as, and I come and I call this my good demo. Um, the reason I like to do that, by the way, this is my number one tip, is when I get distracted in a minute's time, and then I come back and I'm like, what was I doing? Oh, yeah, that's right, I was doing the good demo. All right. The next thing I like to do before I start importing data is to make sure that the options are good for my design. So here under options and settings, specifically I come down here to the data load options. Um, what are the recommendations, guys? Yeah. <laughs> Turn this one off. If you haven't already turned it off globally, turn it off. Look, it really depends, but in Australia, I'm not sure if you're in the UK, but in Australia, uh, it's common that the fiscal year ends on 30 June. All right, so the problem with this auto date time is that quarter one is January, February, March, so it's near useless. So let's definitely turn that off today. We have a micrometer constant problem where whenever we do import models and we publish them to the service afterwards, the month and the year switches round. Could that be why we never think to do that? The month of the year switch around. Yeah. yeah. In the hierarchy. No, in, in data like in data valuation. So we'll have like tables with dates and then we have a date table, we run an import model, we forget to switch off the daytime intelligence. Then we build the measures, it looks good, it's showing what we think. Then we publish to our to the Power BI service 
and it's oh, it's the format. The numbers up and so back and September the 11th is November the 9th, basically. Okay, so it's not using the right format. Um, I hadn't come across that one. Yeah. I just turn it off, uh, so I've never had to deal with it. So, so the good news is, in fact, for those that are not familiar with it, here's evidence that that feature is on, that your date columns, they deliver this really nice hierarchy if you work with calendar time. Um, in fact, what's happening is the hidden table has been created. So it bloats your model, probably doesn't customize it in the way that you want. <coughs> the good news is you can turn it on or off as you like. If you change your mind later on, you can turn it off or on. So definitely I'm going to turn it off, but that's not relevant to my topic tonight. What is relevant is that there are some options for relationships. And I would probably suggest you leave them on, that it will auto-detect and create relationships. But tonight, because it's not a great educational experience, I'm going to turn that behavior off. So I'm forced to assess every relationship and create them manually. By the way, just pointing out up here for the global load options, if you never want to see that auto-date time, you've turned it off. Now that I know that the options are just right for my development, then I'm ready to go ahead and develop my solution. So let me introduce you to the data that I'm going to work with. It's very simplistic. I find that um, it's easy to talk about this theory of the data is simple, simple, simple. Um, Excel doesn't want to open that file, so I'll have to open it this way. All right, so what I have is some sales data here. Uh, very, very simple. Three sales have taken place. We see that we have an order date, we have a ship date, we have a stock keeping unit as the unique identifier for the product. Um, the manager, the sales manager responsible for the sale, weirdly enough, their first and last name is stored here. And then we see some facts like the quantity and the sale price. All right, so to kick off this model design, I'm just going to come to my good model. And I'm going to get data from Excel. And I'm going to import from that table. All right, it comes from a table named sale. Do I load or do I transform data? Right. Load is the select star from, and so because it's an import model, I ask you, and I beg of you actually, to always consider, am I importing just what is necessary? You know, the resources required to host that data um, is memory, and memory is a precious resource in Power BI, whether you're on shared or premium capacity. And so always do the very best to minimize the data you're loading. By the way, you might say today it's not a lot of data, in 10 years' time, the person responsible for this will be cursing you that the, you know, the volumes of history that have to be maintained in this model are now becoming difficult to maintain. All right, so I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to multiply the sale quantity by the sale price, and I'm going to add a new column that is the sale amount. Awesome. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is introduce some other related data. So what I do is I have some product information which is actually stored in CSV. All right, so let's take a look at this. Um, I'm going to create the query and show you that we have these four products, very simple data. Coffee, tea, popcorn, and cookies. We see that the first row is obviously intended to be the header, so I'm gonna add one step to the query that promotes that up. Now notice that the product has a subcategory but we also want some category data as well. And I'll find that the category data is actually stored in Excel. Don't ask me why, but it just makes a good demo tonight. So I have this subcategory Excel workbook here, and this is where you'll see a mapping between subcategories and the categories themselves. Hot beverages belongs to beverages, as is cold beverages, and snacks and meals as a subcategory belong to food. Now, when it comes to performing calculations about whether discounts are being applied, because all we know is that there's a sale price, is that I have another set of data, which is the list price for each product. This is what we should have charged. So for each product, this set of data has the stock keeping unit and the list price. 
So now I'm up to four queries. Next, the manager is responsible for the sale. Sitting in CSV, I have manager here, and we just have the two managers. Angus McDonald and B. Jones, I've got the email address, and this is interesting. I have subcategory information for the manager. What do you think of this might be? Some, some joins. Some joins. Well, conceptually, what does it mean for a business that Angus and B, Angus is um, has hot beverages and B has hot beverages, semicolon, snacks. All right, so I'll tell you what the scenario is, is that from a performance point of view, not only are they responsible directly for sales, but they're measured by sales that have been achieved for products of certain subcategories. It just so happens that B will be measured by the sales of products for two subcategories. All right, so I detect here there's actually uh, two dimensions of play here, right? There's the manager that I'll use to filter and group, and there's subcategory, which clearly belongs to product. So what I'm going to do is rename this query as raw manager. And uh, I'm going to right click it and disable the load. Then what I'll do is reference that, and I'm going to create a new query named manager. And here I have the ability then to just remove subcategory. It's not required. For my manager dimension table, it should just be their names and email address. Awesome. So all of this work has been done. I'm going to come back to Power BI Desktop and save, and it says, hold on, there's queries that need to be applied. Go and apply them and load those tables and their data into my model. All right, remember that I turned off the auto relationship detection, but if I didn't, we would see automatically some relationships would turn up. All right, because it's Star Schema, I'm going to put my sale table here in the middle. And uh, I see that I've got product and product list price and manager over here. Subcategory, what did uh, Rolf Pimble call this arrangement? Subcategory to product, yeah. When the dimensions are normalized, uh, if you use your imagination, it's sort of snowflakes off the sky. Awesome. There's a very important table that's missing. Yeah, date table. Um, so I don't have a source for that. But very quickly, it gives me a time to show off the easy ability not to rely on auto date time but to customize my own that my date table will be generated through the calendar auto function <clears throat> and calendar auto is quite simple it just scans your model for every column of type date it looks at the min and max of every column and it produces or generates the rows of full years that will encompass so you're guaranteed at all times if you have dates we will never have that issue that we've sold a product for a date that doesn't exist. Does it goes back a year, a year further? What it does is it ensures, according to the fact that I passed no argument here, says that December is the last month of my year, and it will guarantee that it has full years. For example, if the minimum sale date was the 5th of February 2017, then the 1st of January 2017 will be the very first row. Now, the cool thing is, as you continue to refresh the model in time, and then the 1st of January 2021 happens, instantly the calculated table will refresh or recalculate to populate through to December 31 of 2021. So we're going to have to think about it. Tonight, keeping it very simple, I'm going to just add a couple of calculated columns because I understand that I filter and I group by year. So then I've added in a year column with CY for the calendar year. Uh, then I need one for month as well. And that'll be enough. So month equals, and I like to use the format function here, format the date column as yyyy-mm. And I have this very simple month column. So when we switch back to the model designer, we see that we now have a date table as well. So the thing about this is models uh, consist of tables, and those tables can either come from Power Query or they can come from DAX expressions. 
right? Uh, do note that Power Query can only ever access external data. The best that DAX can do is either generate data or transform data already loaded into the model. All right, here is my star. Does it look like the star you at this stage? Come on, look at this. Uh, if I was going to use my proper drawing tool, it's like, oh, like that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, let's put it to the test. Um, I am interested to know what my yearly sales amount were. Mm. No, yearly isn't interesting. Let's look at monthly. Aha! How curious is that? Apparently, we've sold exactly 15 every month, and it happens to be that the total is also 15. Is that possible? I'd argue it is. In what circumstance could this be a true of the data? What See, what happens? does total really mean? <coughs> the assumption is it means sum. What if it meant min or max? And we just happen to have sold a min or 15 every month, then that would actually be an accurate report. Right? So don't fall into the beginner's trap that total means sum. It simply means a summarization, which could be anything between sum min, max average count, speed count, etc. Okay. Now the fact is we know it's not right because you already know what the sales data looks like, yes? So when you see this, the culprit is almost always to do with relationships. Either relationships don't exist, or if they do exist, they haven't been correctly configured. So let's do it the long way in demo. And manage relationships of the model. Of course, there are none. I'm going to define a new relationship between the sales table and the date table, relating order date to date. And um, yeah, let's just leave it <coughs> the close. And now we see something that reflects the data as we know it. All right, so whenever you see that situation of repeating values and the total is the same value, it's filter propagation isn't happening as it needs to happen. All right, that was the long way to create a relationship. In fact, you'll see it in the diagram right here. And the easier way to create them is through the drag drop approach. Sales of subcategory to subcategory, SKU to SKU, SKU to SKU. Uh, and then I come to manager. It's like, oops. <coughs> One column in a table relates to a column in a different table. And this is where sometimes your source data just doesn't support you, so you have more work to do in data preparation. So that has me head back here to Power Query. What might I do then with my manager query to produce a single unique column as a key? Yeah, I could do that. That seems like a very temporary solution because, I don't know, John Smith, we recruited him next week, and uh, John Smith, the second John Smith, joins the company next week. All right, so I don't like to gamble with that. There's actually a better way, and um, Rob Kimball would have called this temporary surrogate. Right, let's just add a key that is, in Rob Kimball's terms, was for the warehouse itself. The way that we can do that is add a column, and that's the purpose of the index column here. All right, so let's just add in a new column that creates a sequence for month. And uh, I'm going to rename this as manager key. I'm going to change it to a whole number. And there is my one side. Now, that means I have work to do back in my sale query because it still has manager first name and manager last name. And that's fixed by coming to the home ribbon Merging queries, let's get up to integration, bring in manager. Now I'm pressing the control key, guys. First name, last name matches first name, last name. Have a look at how the ordinal sequence of those. And by the way, beginner's trap is this window looks almost identical to the model relationship window. It's not, it's Power Query merging a query, so it has no concern about multi column merging. When I do this merge, we end up with this new column that I can expand to introduce in the manager key. And now I have the manager key for the other side of the relationship. That means I can go ahead and remove these columns. They're no longer required. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I get it, because if John Smith was twice here, you wouldn't know that it's a different John Smith, is that? All right, so this data is really simplistic, right? So, so the fact is, when it comes to producing unique keys, the surrogate key is my lesson here, is fail group versus concatenating various values in the hope that there's no collision in the future. Good point. <laughs> Take it. All right, so having made those modifications, uh, I can then come back to Power BI Desktop and apply those queries. Where are we? And now I can go ahead and establish that relationship. Manager key relates to manager key. All right, ladies and gentlemen, a star is born. Here we go. So, there's more work to be done though. Let's see what happens when we come back to this visual. And time moves on. Another sale happened on the 4th of April. For exactly the same product we sold in March. I control S to save my data store, and I come back to the model, and I refresh my sales. All right. The message we're getting here is that a one side <coughs> column during refresh has encountered duplicates. All right, so Power BI will protect the integrity of the one side of a relationship. And in fact, we sort of see this now is that here, when I created the relationship, you'll see it's one to one. A downside of the drag drop technique is that if you don't have a lot of data and this happens to be unique on the, what should be the many side, Power BI, with its knowledge of what it's loaded in that column, will choose that it's a one. All right, so easily fixed. In fact, just double click the relationship here, and the cardinality property here should be which? Product to sale is one to many. Uh, I note that it also said that the filter direction should be both. We'll talk about this later, but I'm going to switch it to single for now. All right, and we'll see the same thing for date. Because the order dates were unique on the back table, it assumed that that was a one side as well. So here we have many to one between sale and date, single cross filter direction. So now I'm satisfied. And remember what we learned that the fact table is always on the many side. The dimension table is on the one side. All right, how are we doing so far? Okay, let's take a look at some DAX functions that work with calculations. So here I'm going to add a column to the sale table that uses the related function. Now that we have those relationships in place, see that what the related function does, I'm going to say it does a lookup here it's saying the category column is, oh, I'll just look up the category column value of the subcategory. Not quite true, look up this the right thing. But think of the table expansion that took place. What we're simply saying is, with related, go and get the value in the expanded column for that row in the subcategory. All right, there we go. Related retrieves the value on the one side. Um, let's see a more interesting and practical use of that by now requesting a column for the discount amount. All right, oops, so let's see here that the discount amount is, so for each row, go and get the related list price for whatever the product is, multiply by the sale quantity, and then subtract the sale amount. If there's a difference, then it must be a discount that's being applied. So we only see that applies to one of the rows, for the exact discount. One more example with working with these functions is that we have the related table, which is the many side of the relationship. So here what I'm going to do is come to the subcategory table, and I'm going to add a calculated column that says, tell me the number of orders that have taken place for that subcategory. Related table returns the table of the rows on the many side. Right. That's a terrible example, don't do that. It shows you how the function works, but why do I not want to put the order count in my dimension size? Because you can use a 
information. I could use a measure, or it's a query time evaluation. Why, why am I storing the result, a summarization? Sometimes there's a reason to do it if you recognize that the calculated column that is computed and stored at refresh time, it might be a complex calculation that we delay into or defer into process time, so that at query time, the summarization is quick. Right? But here, most definitely a bad example. And also in my sales table, one of them is a bad example. Putting a column here that is the filtering and grouping in a fact table is something you want to avoid if possible. We can achieve that just by filtering the subcategory table. We don't need to have it in the fact table itself. And especially in recognition that fact tables can grow to be huge. We want them to be as, as small as possible. All right, so that's the concept of working with those functions. All right, the so next topic is there's room for improvement. All right, this works, but we could do things better. So let's take a look first of all at the one-to-one -one relationship. Okay. The recommendation I would give you is, while you can do a one-to-one, -one, and you might think it makes sense when data comes from separate sources, as is the case here, one was Excel, one was CSV, you don't need to model it that way. Uh, the first concern is that for anybody reporting off this model, remember it may not be you, as a report author interpreting the model, I'll find that the attributes that describe product are scattered between two tables. Why well, make their life difficult? Let's consolidate them into a single table. All right, so that is a job for Power Query. I'll just come into the product query here and I'm going to merge in the product list price. There's a one-to-one -one between stock, peak, and unit. I'll introduce the list price into here. And then I will disable the query that Power Query uses to connect to this price. I get a warning. By doing so, you're going to remove the model from the table. That's exactly what I want. So when I come back to the diagram here and apply the changes, watch closely here, we now see that list price is just a column of product where it probably belongs. That's so generally speaking, while you can do a one-to-one -one in the model, probably better to pre-consolidate into a single table. Um, that will have caused a slight problem, by the way, is that the uh, discounted amount is now broken. All right, so that's where I typically get my tables and relationships right first before I start building calculations, so I avoid <laughs> refactoring things later on. All right, so that's the topic of one-to-one, generally consolidate. Uh, now, when we take a look at subcategory to product, this concept of snowflaking is what people would refer to. You could do that, but again, for the product entity, it probably makes sense that they're all fields in a single table, right? So let's just use the same approach to consolidate them, even though it's a one to many. So I come back to the product query, and I'll merge in this time the subcategory query, where we have a match on subcategory and then introduce category. Disable the subcategory query. Now a benefit of doing this, by the way, is that I can now define a hierarchy. A hierarchy with levels from category to subcategory to product, it's not possible to have a hierarchy that spans across multiple tables. Please tell me that that's not a bug that's frozen everything. Saving. All right. If this happens, make sure you save and you close everything and reopen. And in terms of storage, Peter, for that kind of scenario, if it was a set of a big uh, dimension tables, it's not worth worrying about. Is it the concept of um, snowflake versus not snowflake? Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not like any other way, I suppose. There can be differences when you get to extreme large volumes. And that's, that's the debate about when in a relational data warehouse you should snowflake. But if it's extreme large volumes of data, the denormalization would play against you. Right. So in the import model, it could, I'm not sure what the tipping point is, Chris. We're talking tens of thousands or millions. I'm not sure, but I'd be worried about the processing time and refresh times as well. Denormalization. 
So it's one of those ones where you just try both ways and you just measure and see how does that work out. You know? Again, it's, it's art versus science sometimes too. Could you explain what you want to normalize in the Okay, so when we have the concept of uh, my bad example, this is what we refer to as denormalized. If it was a relational system, we pre-joined everything into a flat result, denormalized. Normalization is the reverse of that, which is what our star schema is doing. Let's break that into separate tables. So the concept of product, where we had subcategory table and product table, was that the product dimension had been normalized into two tables. By just merging them together, we have denormalized them into a flat set. All right, hopefully this has now worked. Yes, it has, and it's enabled. So I'm now able to do this. Right click the category column, create a hierarchy, name this products. I don't know why. Does anyone know why levels of a hierarchy are advanced? They're not optional. <laughs> All right, so I've sort of argued that that should be hidden from us. And we add in the levels of some category. We add in the level of product. We apply the changes. This hierarchy concept was not possible with the two table design we had already. Right. So now we've got a single table. All product related fields are found in one location. We have the benefit of a hierarchy. By the way, those hierarchies are optional. What do I mean by that? If I didn't create it, it still report. I'll still respect the hierarchy because they're in the nature of the table where it's structured anyway. They'll go just flow through. Well, one of the difference is that if I wanted to create a visual, I could manually drag category, subcategory, <laughs> and produce exactly the same result. So in my thinking, I always define hierarchies because it declares to my report authors the potential. And what a hierarchy really represents is that there are relationships between columns within the table itself. Countries have states, states have cities, cities have postal codes. For someone not familiar with your model, they may not detect those relationships if the hierarchy isn't declared in front of them. Alrighty, so how are we doing? It's looking more like a star scheme now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So next topic to deal with is the relationship I have here between sale and date. Now, in fact, if you hover over the relationship, the tip here is it reveals to you the columns that are related. Here we see that order date relates to date, and yet the sale table has another type of date, the shipment date of the order. Right? Well, it sounds to me that we should just create another relationship to the same table. And Power BI won't complain, but you'll see here that there can only be one active path. That solid line represents an active path that says that is how filter propagation happens. You can create multiple paths between tables, but there may only be one active path. Therefore, the dashed line represents inactive. What does this mean to our result? All right. Let me go ahead and just increase the size of this so we can all see it clearly. What I'll do is manage the relationships, and you'll see that this column here is the active versus inactive property of the relationship. You have to do this in the right way. I'm going to deactivate the order date relationship. I'm going to activate then the ship date. Click close. And we now see that nothing was shipped in January. We have shipped in February and March. Okay. So what did Rob Kimball refer to this as? What is date to me? Role plane dimension. Role plane dimension, right? Sometimes it means order date, sometimes it means shift date. And in a relational data warehouse, this would be the appropriate way to do it. <laughs> one table, and if we were enforcing referential integrity, we'd have multiple foreign keys, which is totally valid in a relational design. But knowing that relationships in the model are filter propagation, it has to be deterministic. There can only be one path that it takes, and that is what the active relationship does. Now, you have a choice here. You can say, all right, well, I'll do it this way. And in my calculation expressions, I will control whether a relationship switches its status from active to inactive, right? So let's take a look at what we could do. I'm going to create a measure that says shift date. So <coughs> look at this. So here is a uh, calculation that says go ahead and summarize the sales amount, sum them, 
And the dex function use relationship is really a modifier. The calculate function, its role is to manipulate the filter context. And the use of use relationship as an argument allows you to switch the active versus inactive for the evaluation of that calculate. Now they both produce the same results. That's simply because shift date is already active. But if I then switch this back that order date is active, we now have the benefit of seeing the sale amount based on order date versus the shift date. So the use relationship is designed to do this. But a downside of this design, in fact, there's two, can anyone think, of having to produce these measures that activate or inactivate relationships? If I have lots of sales measures, you know, quantity and year to date sales, it's tedious. I then have to create shift equivalents. If I have delivery date in there as well, and you know invoice date, you're going to spend a lot of time creating this Cartesian product of measures and role playing dimensions. And the other issue is that if I need to simultaneously, in the same visual, filter or group by shift date and order date, I can't do it. Right? Which would lend it to a better design. And that design is another time. Yeah. yeah. The role-playing dimensions, what we want is active relationships. If we know that we need to simultaneously filter by order and shift date, we will need two tables. So the easiest way to clone a table, control C, control V. What's the easiest way to clone a table? I would suggest there's an easier way than going in and duplicating the power query. Yeah, just create a table in DAX. The data is already in the model. We just want a duplicate of the date table. So a new table is going to be named ship date. Equals. Yeah. That is how you find a table. Does it increase the size of my model? Yes, it does. But for role playing dimensions, generally you'll find the characteristic of a dimension table is that they're typically wide with columns for filtering and grouping, but they're generally shallow. You know, we might have 50, 100 products. There's always exceptions, but generally speaking, dimension tables are quite small. So duplicating them in this way. And I have one model with a custom date table. So that's just the way that they analyze by time. And it's not a biggie. You know, 10 years of data is what, 3,652 rows of data. My recommendation is that when you do this, that you go ahead and rename the columns. Like, while it's valid to have duplicate column names in the model, providing they're in different tables, um, if you want your visuals and legends and titles to be um, self-describing and accurate, then go ahead and rename these as ship date, ship year, ship month. By the way, I didn't mark these as date tables. I should have, but time is really against me tonight. All right, so now I have the ability to do this. Take so, can you say that again? So, what you didn't do? I didn't mark them as date tables. Do I need to mark them as date tables, everybody? Right click the date table, mark as a date table. What you're doing is letting Power BI know that the table is suitable for time intelligence calculations and enforcing uniqueness on the date column. All right. Um, there's no visual indicator that you've done that. The visual indicator might be that your time intelligence tax formulas actually work as you want. Okay. <laughs> All right, so where are we at? I now have ship date, and I'm going to create a relationship here between ship date and ship date, active, and it allows me to do something like this. Let me add in a stacked column chart where I'm going to put um, month on the axes and shipped month on the legend, and then I want to see quantity. I don't know why Power BI sorts them in descending order, but let's fix that. And so now what I could do is see, you know, by month, by, by order, and by ship, what's going on. Couldn't do this within inactive relationship. Uh, and sort a second. Let's just play with the data a little bit. What's going to happen here if I add in another order? And it hasn't been shipped yet. Save that, refresh the sale data. 
so the many side has a blank. And there we go. What that would tell us is that in April of 2020, I know it hasn't happened yet, uh, was that uh, a quantity of three is yet to be shipped, but this portion here was shipped in, um, uh, in the same month. All right, so a customer of mine is an airline. On time performance, from airport to airport, you have a single airport table, but to have departure and arrival airport, they must be separate tables. All right, so I have a departure airport table, arrival airport table, two active relationships to the flight table. That's how it's done. So we generally say do not repeat data in the model, but here's an exception to that rule. Yes. You always enforce that then, never use inactive relationships. No, there's always exceptions to the rule. Let's just say that ship date, there was only one calculation that would ever need it. It was actually a measure that needed it, and we weren't going to filter a group by it for visualization purpose, then I would do it as an inactive, okay. and then I would use the use relationship and calculate it. All right, but if you know that you must filter and group by arrival and departure, and especially simultaneously, and you don't want to write lots of versions of measures for those scenarios, all right, so generally speaking, I avoid inactive. Most models I have do not have inactive relationships. Okay, so we move on with the um, oh yeah, one more thing as a tip. Um, when people interpret your model here, how do they know how filter propagation is working when they look at the field space? How do they know that they filter by the year field of the date table, but it's order date here? Well, they would have read the comprehensive documentation that you would have <laughs> uh, But my recommendation for this is, uh, like, let's just say date. Uh, there's a description property that you can put on a table, and you can do something like this. Filters sale by order date. All right, so you can communicate back to your report authors that, yeah, it is this one. If you go to filter sale and use sale measures, it's actually order date that it represents. <coughs> it would be nice if the fields bank could pop up a diagram or something and tell people how they work. At the moment, that's the way you're going to communicate. It's right. Right. Would it not be best practice also to hide the ship date from the fact table? So they would never get confused and not use it. Yeah, I'm coming to that. So at the moment I haven't hidden anything. Sorry. But yes, yes. We shouldn't have, preferably if you do have similarly named columns, like on either side of the relationship, then only one of them should be visible. It's the preferred practice. Right, we'll come to that later on. All right, so there we go. Star schema, we've talked about one for many. Great. One for many is the staple of model design. You've got the single column, unique, in a dimension table, and the many-sided fact table. Let's make things a little more interesting then. I have some more data. Uh, and that data happens to be a CSV file representing sale targets. Let's have a look at the sale target data. Let's understand this. The granularity of sale target is at month and subcategory level. And then we have a target quantity that we would like to achieve. All right, let's uh, transform this data and have a look at it. So the month translates to become a date type, and then we have the subcategory and we have the target quantity. Looks good. All right, back here, we apply the changes and load the targets in. And the question is, how can we relate this to our existing design? That was a question. How can I relate this to my existing design? So it's going to go to the month and date. Um, it's the post of the month. Only. Right. So, so the month, while it is monthly, we have stored the first date of that month. So January 2020 is actually stored as the first of January 2020. That means I can create a relationship because these are the same times. Not a problem. That's just a standard <coughs> one to many. Although we would want to think about what happens if we were filtering by the 20th of January. What's going to happen? It'll only work. Literally, it thinks the target must be achieved on the first of each month, and then you can relax for the rest of the month and do nothing. That's what the model thinks. All right, let's come to the subcategory. What's my challenge here? It's made to me. <coughs> 
many to many. Well, the cardinality is many to many, right? We do not have a unique column for the one side. So you see that when I create the relationship, the Power BI knows this. There are duplicate subcategories on both sides. So it's saying that the cardinality is many to many, and then it's giving us this awful warning. And by awful, I mean it's just not helpful. All right. In fact, if we had time and we don't, I'd click on learn more, and we'd have to read through, I don't know, 20 minutes of examples of theory that don't really get to the point. <laughs> the warning here is telling us, okay, from many to many, we see that it's configured that. And this should only be used if it's expected that neither column contains unique values and that the significantly different behavior of many to many relationships is understood. This is already overloaded because many to many, as you'll learn in the next series of demos, mean different things. Remember that managers have subcategories? There's a many to many between two dimensions. Managers have <laughs> more than one subcategory, and subcategories can have more than one manager. Is that the arrangement here? That a target can belong to multiple subcategories, and a subcategory can all have multiple targets. It's not quite the same concept. Really, what it's saying here is there is no unique column to form a one to many relationship. <coughs> it's a many to many cardinality, but it's not a many to many relationship. And that's where the term is overloaded. Right? They're both valid problems that we might need to solve. So let me create the relationship, although, what I'll point out here is that filter propagation wants to go both ways. I'm going to make it single, and then remember it's the dimension <coughs> that filters the fact. So product filters will propagate down to sale target. All right, and then what we see is, oh, and it's also made it inactive, I don't know why. We have the many to many. Let me make it active. Okay, so what does this mean. Let's have a look in the report. Okay, so a new page to the report. Let's take a look at um, a table of month and subcategory targets. Uh, I'll just increase that to make it easy for you guys to see. So maybe 6K. Does that look sane? I don't want category in there, why is it there? Does that look sane? For this month, for this subcategory, you need to achieve 500 there. I would argue, yes, it does. What if I clone that visual, control C, control V, and I say, but show me at product level? Is that the same? We are now beneath the granularity of our sale target. And that's what the warning is informing us of, that if you're going to filter beneath the granularity of that many to many, you're going to get a strange result. It's actually accurate, but it might it's easily misinterpreted is really the point. Okay, and it's a weak relationship. If there's integrity issues, it may eliminate data and therefore understate what you're measuring. So they're the two warnings that you would take for granted. But that is the purpose of our new many to many cardinality. It is relatively new. And it is to support where you've got a higher level relationship between a dimension and a fact table, and you don't have that single unique column. What we were forced to do in the past was to break that product table back to the subcategory table I had before, where it had a unique subcategory column. All right, now we don't need to do that. So the many-to-many -many cardinality is solving the problem of a higher level relationship in terms of granularity. The fact table is stored at a higher granularity than the dimension table. Awesome. Making sense? Maybe. All right, so there's more. Let's just explore then the concept of cross-filled direction. There are only two options you have, unless it's many to many, in which case the single could come from either side. OK, always. Filter propagation is from the one side to the many side, always. 
And you have the option to propagate back. We call it bi-directional or um, cross-filtering. So on the many side to the one side. So I could come here and say, all right, well, let's filter both. And the visual indicator in the diagram now is that filter propagation happens both ways. Um, and then I could start doing this for all my tables, going, well, this sounds really cool. <laughs> and we'll see with it. Um, hold on a minute. You can't do it in this instance. And the purpose and the reason for this is, by the way, is that if you were going to filter, for example, what are we going to do here? I'm going to filter date. And it propagates to sale target. And it propagates to sale. So see this? Dates propagate to sale. They propagate to sale target. And then if I was trying to make this bi-directional, it would propagate to here. It would propagate to here, and you'd end up with a circular reference. Okay, so it's not all out. The fact that it's not allowed is the very first good reason not to be doing this. In fact, there's really only one valid time to propagate in both directions, and that is to solve the many-to-many -many that we're working up to. All right, but what I have seen some of my customers attempt to do is to, is to repeat the behavior of what pivot tables in Excel do with their slices. And it's a wonderful capability, is that when I slice by calendar year 2020, all of a sudden, the product slicer only shows me items that were sold in 20. And that, that can be useful, but I'd also argue that it's confusing to users. Why, why does that product disappear? They, they don't get it. And it creates confusion. When you introduce confusion, that results in distrust and eventual abandonment of your solution. Okay, that's doomsday. But it also puts pressure on Power BI. That bi-directional filtering is a lot of extra work, and it can slow down reports. So therefore, on your capacities, the concurrency is reduced. So it's a needs basis only, and I'm going to build up the case of that. So I'm going to double click here and switch that back to single. The case for bi-directional filtering is to resolve a many-to-many -many between two dimensions. What were those dimensions tonight? Managers and subcategories. All right, so let's come back to Power Query where the work will be done. Remember, I've got this raw manager query where I've got the manager and I happen to have subcategories here as well. So I need to create a new query. Let me reference raw manager and create manager subcategory. And what I need is a table that's going to have the manager key and subcategory. And I would like this table to have three rows. Remember, the first salesperson had beverages, but the next one has beverages and snacks, I think. Help me out here, guys. How am I going to do it? Split columns. The columns. Well, let's focus on manager first of all. I need to bring in manager key. So let me go ahead and merge queries back to my manager with the surrogate key as defined. So control key, first name, last name, first name, last name. Bring in manager key. And then remove all of these manager attributes. Now, what was the suggestion? How am I going to tabularize that delimited data in the columns? Create columns using split columns. I like the split columns. Right click this column, split column by delimiter. The delimiter happens to be semicolon. And the default option here is for each occurrence, just split it out into columns. Who knows? There could be 15 columns if one manager had 15 subcategories. There we go. So now I've got subcategory one and two. What's next? Undo the last step. Undo the last step because it's not worth it. Is it split into rows? Oh, is there? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Chris is keeping me honest. All right, what am I doing, Chris? So split column again. Do what you did. Yep. Make a letter. Yep. Let's have a column and under advance. <laughs> yeah. Into rows. Oh, when did this come? <laughs> a while ago. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the Australian version of Power BI test took six months ago. Ah, 
Okay. Okay. All right. It was done in one step. All right. Beautiful. What would Frank? Uh, what would Frank? What would Ralph Kimball call this once loaded to the model? What type of table is it? Bridge table. So you change your dimension. No. Bridge, bridge table. Bridge table. Yeah, I think he had a different name. Factless fact tables. It's a fact table, right? It's describing the relationships between dimensions, but factless because there are no measures. No, I mean, it could be, but in this instance, there are not. It's just a dimension key and a dimension key. So what we're doing here is adding to the model a table that is a fact table. Technically, it's referred to as a factless fact table, but it's also referred to as a bridging table. That, I think, is more a terminology in relational databases, isn't it? We have a many to many. But either way, it does the same thing. So now what I've got is this. We can relate subcategory to subcategory. We've got manager. So what are we going to do? Subcategory to subcategory. What type of uh, cardinality is that? Many to many? Yeah. Okay, because there is no unique column on either side. So we're going to filter from product. Okay. And keep the relationship active. And then manager key to manager key. Is that allowed? Apparently. Is that a circular reference? No, because there's no bidirectional filter. Yeah, so when you look at it, it's like a filter on manager will propagate to these tables, but it will not continue to propagate back. So there's no circular reference. It looks like it, but if you look at the arrows, it's not. All right, so how is this going to work? Uh, okay, well, let's just put it to the test. I'm going to bring in, uh, create a table that is going to give me just the first name of the manager. And we want to know their sales. Cool, we already know that. And uh, I want to know, yeah, actually, that's enough sales. So the question is, what does that represent? We know that if filter propagation is not happening here, then it must be the manager directly responsible for the sale. If we could get filter propagation working <coughs> this way, it would represent the sales for their sales performance. The manager is responsible for subcategories and the marketing of them at the same time as selling. So we want the filter propagation to work the other way. What could I do? Follow the arrow. See, if I filter here, as in I'm currently grouping by first name, so that's a filter. It's propagating to here, but it's not propagating to here. So let's make this bidirectional. Am I allowed to do this? Yes, I have it. Is this making sense? If I filter manager, it will filter here, it'll filter here, it'll filter here, and it'll filter here. Is that not a circular reference? In fact, it is. That's mm -hmm. probably a bug in Power BI Desktop. But there are precedence rules when Power BI evaluates the filter context. And it basically comes down to the fewer number of hosts. All right. So even though this is happening, it is ignoring the propagation via manager subcategory and product. Okay. So what I could do, let's do this by looking at the visual. Um, if I just modify the properties here and I said, let's just deactivate the relationship between sale and manager. And it should therefore force propagation to go the other way. Indeed it does. So what we're now seeing is that the sale managers and the sales related to the products of the subcategories that they've been assigned to. Fascinating. Probably not a good final result. What type of table is manager then? It's a dimension table. But it's a role playing dimension, isn't it? Sometimes it's the manager directly responsible for the sale, and sometimes it's the sales performance of the manager. But we need both. So how could I do that in my model? Well, I could create a clone of the manager table. 
right? And therefore, I'd have sales performance manager. But let me show you another technique where we could keep the one manager table and have our cake and eat it. All right, so what I'll do is I'll make this relationship active again. And I'll switch to some calculation logic here. And yeah, this might be already good. What I'm going to do is introduce a measure on the cell table. So notice I'm getting different results here, and the secret of this, where is my measure? There it is. I'm disabling the relationship for the purpose of the calculation. So cross filter says here, the relationship between manager and sale, set it to none. So for the evaluation of the calculator, you have the ability to turn off the relationship or modify it from one or both or both to one. The other approach could be we could work with virtual relationships. Okay, so what I'll do is, in this case, I'm going to delete this relationship so there's no longer this concept of circular. Can I just ask, is that data as it was correct? That was not quite sure it was. Yeah, yeah if, we, if we teased it out, we would see because the um, sales manager B, I think it is, that B has, um, B is number two, and if we look at the, um, where's that original table? B has both hot beverages and snacks. So for all products related to those, and that's why we see that B gets the larger, oh, well, because I just deleted the relationship, yeah, sure. it's gone. So what I'm about to do now is, remember, the relationship's deleted. So filters now, we're grouping by first name. There is no filter propagation happening here. But we have a function called treat as that allows me to virtually propagate. And uh, so therefore, I'm going to override the old measure with this one. I can do a better job with laying this out. Calculate the sum of sales amount, but treat as whatever the values are on the manager key. So whatever's in filter context of the manager key column on the manager table, uh, what you're going to do is push them to the manager subcategory table, and then you're going to turn off the, um, the propagation between manager and sales. What happens so, if you don't turn that off? Do you get both filters apart? Again, the precedence rule would say, so if I then said here that that's, just make that one, so they're both applying. So they're both applying. I have to stop and think about it. But yes. <laughs> so you've got filters coming from both. So you're getting an intersection. Yeah. So the ability to create virtual relationships, which we have. Okay. That's my attempt at good modeling. Uh, in fact, the way I like to sort of wrap it up is that the polished result would be something like this. This bridging table, this fact, this fact table, it can be hidden. When it comes to the columns involved in the relationship, so we've got, um, what have we got, SKU, I'd probably leave it visible here, that's a, not a surrogate key. Um, month and subcategory here could be hidden. Uh, manager key could be hidden. Here, all of these can be hidden. I think that's really important um, that the columns that are there to support relationships or indeed tables like that factless fact table shouldn't by default be available in the field plan. Okay. So we've got this comparison now of good versus bad. <coughs> The way I'd like to wrap up is just a lot of um, summarization of the good modeling guidance. So from a modeling point of view, strive for star schema design. The table should be either dimension table or fact table. There are sometimes exceptions for this in a sale table. I might include a column for filtering like the sale order number. So what did uh, Ralph Kimball call this? If I decided to leave sales order number in the dimension table, 
degenerate dementia. If it's just a single column sales order, I would argue that it stays in the fact table. There's no point duplicating a single column in a dimension table. Right? But generally speaking, otherwise, dimension tables for filtering and grouping, fact tables for summarization. Learn about all of those star schema concepts. I like grab the, the uh, data warehouse toolkit. It's still a very valid publication. And the opening chapters speak to you as a Power BI modeler. So learning about surrogate keys, snowflake dimensions, role-playing dimensions. We didn't talk about junk dimensions, but they play a role as well. Measures and factless fact tables. When it comes to one-to-one -one relationships, consolidate. When you saw my subcategory of products, they belong to the same entity. Unless there's a compelling reason due to volumes of data, bring them in as a single model table. Active versus inactive. Avoid inactive unless you're really aware that it's a benefit to do so. Otherwise, go ahead and duplicate the table and create active relationships to support simultaneous filtering across those roles. Many to many, now this is an overloaded terminology, there's many to many cardinality and there's many to many between dimensions themselves. <laughs> All right, so the first one is relating facts of a higher grain. That is what the many to many is really being defined for. Um, but you saw that we used it anyway between product and the manager subcategory table. So it can be used to resolve many to many at higher levels too. Um, when it's two dimensions, you will need to introduce a new table into the model like my manager subcategory. Basically each row is the many to many relationships. Bidirectional filtering. Microsoft really only <coughs> wanted to use it to resolve a many to many because filter propagation, as we'll see here, Here, we needed the many to many to get the filter propagation over to product to get to sale. All right, so avoid it in all other circumstances if you can. Data integrity violation, just a quick comment about this. So, this is an important topic if you have weak relationships. <coughs> and I just want to demonstrate something here with the monthly sales. What would it mean if I sold a product that didn't exist. <coughs> there it is. That is not an okay place. When the many side has a value that the one side doesn't have, you have to fix the data in the model. If it's the other way around, That's not possible. If ship date is blank, that might make sense within your business rules. The ship hasn't happened yet. So the many side being blank, okay, but the many side having a value that doesn't exist on the one side, fix it. And that'll certainly be a problem with a weak relationship because it will eliminate it from the result. Okay. Uh, all right, that's data integrity. Direct query models, just a, a quick discussion about those. Um, you've got a couple of options there. The assume referential integrity should be enabled if you know that the integrity is being enforced in the system itself. You'll get more efficient in the joins. And if you do have multi-column relationships in your source system, you can use the combined values and DAX function to create a calculated column that direct query will use to create multi-column joins. The composite models, the thing to watch there is uh, that you will have weak relationships across your data islands. Right. So, by the way, composite modeling is an advanced, it's not a BI analyst role, it's really a BI developer. The biggest preference is that you data warehouse and pre-consolidate, that you don't need a composite model. All right. But if you must, just be aware of the downside of um, those weak relationships. That pretty much brings us to the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? Enough coming for questions. Yeah, so when you closed your tables and you created the first, sorry, when you merged your queries and then you went to delete the other table, you disabled the load. Oh, so in Power Query. Yeah. So, so did that not mean that then you're stopping any new subcategories from coming through? No, not not at all. So let me explain that these are still queries that connect to. The difference is they're not loaded to the model, but it is consumed. Well, it is it, it is basically used by other queries. So the difference here is that when you disable it, it simply doesn't get imported from the model, but it is used to pre-process it. Okay. 
Okay, so it's a data reduction technique. We eliminate data that the model doesn't need. One of those techniques is ensure you disable queries that aren't required to be loaded to the model. Right. Um, later on, your um, the size of the of the Sorry, the reduction to size. Yes, so simply because we've disabled the query, its result is not loaded to the model, therefore the PBIS file will be smaller. When you mentioned that it will use more efficient inner joins rather than left joins, does that mean, that doesn't mean if you've got a dimension table that doesn't have a value in the back table that it will exclude it, will it? So you're talking about a direct query model? Yeah, well, you said. So yeah. the assume referential integrity is only enabled for when both tables are. So what would happen is you better get it right, because if referential integrity is not being enforced or is not in place, it will use an inner join, and then the consequence of that is it will eliminate where there's no matching values on either side. You could have a dimension table that has a value that hasn't, the mo that hasn't yet got a value in the back table, couldn't it? <laughs> yes, well, then that would be a problem. So it's using inner join. So I guess that's another consideration is like ship date, we shouldn't do it for that relationship. Never thought about it, but that's exactly right. It would eliminate sales that have not yet been shipped. Okay. Cool. If you have any more questions, Peter is going to be here. So you can have questions or ask questions over Pizza. But on this note, I'm really sorry to interrupt because uh, Pizza is getting cold and there are probably many people want to get home <laughs> as well. Um, thank you so much, Peter, for coming again. And uh, this is the third time you are here. And yet again, another fantastic presentation. So see you welcome. Um, if you'd like to download the presentation, feel free to do so. And I'll send you the link. You can email that. Yeah.